Greetings, and welcome back to the channel, as we continue to delve into the world of science fiction cinema. Sci-fi in 1941 was mostly about low-budget, mad scientists, and monsters. Over the last few years, Hollywood wasn't interested in taking chances with larger-budget sci-fi films unless they were mixed with the popular horror genre. Sure, there were a few sci-fi successes, but the industry was still reeling from the failures of Just Imagine in 1930 and Things to Come from 1936. This is a trend that will continue throughout the decade. A new subgenre of sci-fi made its first appearance in 1941, the comic book superhero. Though not always taken seriously by everyone, they are an important part of this series. These films feature advanced technology, scientific experimentation, and speculative concepts. Many superheroes delve into themes like genetic mutations, alien origins, futuristic gadgets, and the moral and ethical implications of these elements, all of which are the hallmarks of science fiction. In 1941, Republic Pictures made cinematic history with The Adventures of Captain Marvel, a 12-episode serial that was the first live-action superhero adaptation based on a comic book character. Republic Pictures initially wanted the rights to Superman in 1940, but was unable to secure them, so they produced the mysterious Dr. Satan instead, which I discussed in my last episode. Republic's second attempt at comic book heroes arrived with Captain Marvel. The serial was co-directed by William Whitney and John English, both experienced in crafting serials for Republic Pictures, such as Dick Tracy Returns and The Fighting Devil Dogs. The cast featured Tom Tyler as Captain Marvel and Frank Coughlin Jr. as Billy Batson, Captain Marvel's alter ego. The story begins with an archaeological expedition in Siam. A young radio operator, Billy Batson, gains the power to transform into the superhero Captain Marvel by uttering the magic word, Shazam. When a mysterious scorpion idol is discovered, the expedition members divide up the quartz lenses to prevent misuse. Billy, empowered by the wizard Shazam, must protect the group and defeat the Scorpion before the evil mastermind can control the planet. The serial had a budget of $140,000. Filming included innovative special effects for the flying sequences, using a 15-pound dummy and pulley systems to create the illusion of flight. Stuntman David Sharp enhanced the realism by shooting takeoffs and landings, while close-ups of Tom Tyler were created by having him pose against rear projected clouds. There was some criticism of Tom Tyler's initial casting, as he did not closely resemble the comic book character. In response, Fawcett Comics adjusted the character's appearance in the comics to better match the actor's appearance. The serial was re-released in 1953 as The Return of Captain Marvel, and again in 1966 as a feature film during the Batman craze. The Adventures of Captain Marvel set a high standard for superhero films and had a lasting impact on the genre. Created by C.C. Beck and Bill Parker for Fawcett Comics in 1939, Captain Marvel was a top-selling superhero in the 1940s, even outselling Superman. Fawcett stopped publishing the comics in 1953 after DC Comics began a copyright lawsuit they claimed the character was too similar to Superman. In 1972, Fawcett licensed Captain Marvel to DC Comics, and they acquired the full rights in 1991. By then, Marvel Comics had its own Captain Marvel, so DC rebranded the character as Shazam. The character has since appeared in various projects over the years, including a 1970s TV series, an animated series in the 1980s, and he was played in the DCEU movies by Zachary Levi. This was a great way to start the adaptation of the comic book superhero genre on screen. Filled with smart characters and varied action scenes instead of just going from fist fight to fist fight, like in most 1930s serials. 
It's better than the DCEU, in my opinion, but I'm not the biggest fan of superhero movies. The Adventures of Captain Marvel is available on DVD and Blu-ray and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below, and I recommend checking it out. Before we dive into the films of 1941, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. Up in the sky! Look! It's a plane! It's a plane! It's Superman! Superman the Mad Scientist is an iconic American short film created by Fleischer Studios and distributed by Paramount Pictures. Paramount secured the rights to Superman in 1941 and brought on Fleischer Studios, the company known for animating characters like Betty Boop and Popeye. Fleischer Studios produced the first nine episodes between 1941 and 1942. However, internal conflicts between owners Max and Dave Fleischer caused Paramount to oust the brothers, then take over and rebrand the company as Famous Studios, which produced the remaining eight episodes until 1943. When first hired, the Fleischer brothers requested a budget of $100,000 per 10-minute cartoon, but Paramount gave them $50,000 for the first one and $30,000 for later episodes. Despite financial constraints, the high budget was deemed necessary to achieve more realistic animation. The first of 17 shorts, The Mad Scientist, was released in September and directed by Dave Fleischer. The film featured a talented voice cast, including Bud Collier as Clark Kent and Superman, and Joan Alexander as Lois Lane, both of whom voiced the characters in the Adventures of Superman radio series. Max Fleischer served as the main producer, and Sammy Timberg provided the music score. We follow Superman as he battles an unnamed mad scientist who threatens Metropolis with a deadly ray machine. Reporter Lois Lane investigates, but is captured by the villain when she goes to his mountain lair. Clark Kent dons his Superman costume, uses his powers to prevent the Daily Planet building from being toppled by the ray, and battles the death ray itself. He rescues Lois and apprehends the scientist, saving the day. At this time, Superman in the comics could only leap from building to building, but in this cartoon, he's depicted as flying. A change made for practical reasons, as animating flight was easier and more visually appealing than showing a guy jumping from building to building. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. The infant of Krypton is now the man of... The second short of 1941, The Mechanical Monsters, was released in November and expanded on the Superman mythology. This was the first time we'd see Clark Kent change into Superman in a phone booth. This time around, his foe has an army of robots that were a nod to the water boiler style Republic robot, shown in many of Republic serials, starting with the Undersea Kingdom. Superman, with the help of Lois, once again saves the day and brings peace to Metropolis. The animation and story in this second short are both improved with many of the staples we'd see in later Superman versions already on the screen, except for the line, truth, justice, and the American way, which wouldn't be spoken until the radio series episode that aired in September 1942, after the U.S. was engaged in World War II. The Mad Scientist was nominated for the Best Animated Short Subject Oscar, but lost out to Pluto and Linda Paul. The animated style and color schemes in these cartoons influenced later series, such as Batman, the animated series, and Superman, the animated series, from the 1990s. During World War II, Superman became a symbol of American morality and patriotism, often depicted fighting Nazis, a positive hero for a difficult time. Many actors would go on to play the role in the live-action versions, 
including George Reeves in 1952 in the television series. Christopher Reeves would star in four films. Henry Cavill would take up the mantle in the DCEU. And there's a new version currently in production, starring David Cornsweet. Superman the Mad Scientist and Superman the Mechanical Monsters are available on DVD and Blu-ray on the Max Fleischer's Superman Collection 1941 to 1943. They are also streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Mad Made Monster released by Universal Pictures is a blend of science fiction and horror, directed by George Wagner, known for his work on The Wolfman, also from 1941. Starring Lon Chaney Jr. as Dan McCormick, the film marks Chaney's debut in Universal's horror lineup. He is joined by Lionel Atwell as the sinister Dr. Paul Riggis. Ann Nagel, Frank Albertson, and Samuel S. Hines are featured in supporting roles and all appeared in films I've discussed in previous episodes. Atwill co-starred in 1939's Son of Frankenstein. He would team up again with Lon Chaney Jr. in 1942's The Ghost of Frankenstein. Nagel appeared in 1940's Black Friday, Albertson in Just Imagine and A Connecticut Yankee, and Hines had roles in Deluge and Night Key. The story centers on McCormick, a carnival performer who survives a bus accident involving high-voltage power lines. Intrigued by McCormick's resistance to electricity, Dr. John Lawrence invites him to his lab. Lawrence's assistant experiments on McCormick when no one is looking. He is then transformed into an electric man, gifted with the ability to absorb and discharge energy. The script was originally conceived in 1936 as a possible vehicle for Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, but was shelved due to similarities to Karloff and Lugosi's 1936 film, The Invisible Ray. Revived in 1940, George Wagner, under the pen name Joseph West, reworked the script and the film was shot in just three weeks on a budget of $84,000. Despite financial constraints, Man-Made Monster showcased decent visual effects, including Cheney's glowing appearance. Crafted by visual effects artist John P. Fulton, known for his work on Frankenstein, The Mummy, and The Invisible Man. Critically, the film received mixed reviews. Praised for its special effects and Cheney's performance, yet criticized for its unoriginal story. Variety highlighted Cheney's flourishing talent in the horror genre, but the New York Times called it, quote, silly, and its low-grade shocker fare. Man-Made Monster was re-released in 1953 with the title The Atomic Monster, an influence to 1956's Indestructible Man, also starring Cheney. This isn't a great film, but it has decent visuals, and cinematography for a low-budget B-film of the time. I always like to see women who are more than just damsels in distress, and Nagel delivered. The film did well enough to get Cheney a contract at Universal, and he would rise to fame later in 1941 with the release of The Wolfman. Man-Made Monsters available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below, if you would like to check it out. The Devil Commands is another entry in Columbia Pictures' Boris Karloff Mad Scientist series. We've already looked at The Man They Could Not Hang and Before I Hang. This film was directed by Edward Dimitrik. He blends elements of science fiction and horror to create a tale of grief and scientific obsession. Dimitrik would be nominated for Best Director in 1947 for his film Crossfire, and would go on to direct The Kane Mutiny in 1954, starring Humphrey Bogart. In 1947, Dimitrik faced controversy, as he was blacklisted during the House Un-American Activities Committee investigations, also known as HUAC. He was one of the Hollywood Ten, a group of filmmakers cited for contempt of Congress, for refusing to cooperate with the investigation into alleged communist influence in the film industry. Boris Karloff stars as Dr. Julian Blair, 
a scientist driven to madness by the sudden death of his wife in a car accident. Blair uses his research on human brainwaves to try to communicate with his dead wife. His obsession leads him to an isolated New England mansion, where he conducts increasingly dangerous and unethical experiments with the aid of Mrs. Walters, a fake medium played by Anne Revere. The plot unfolds as Dr. Blair's experiments become increasingly bizarre, involving grave robbing and murder. His daughter, his colleagues, and even the local sheriff become entangled in his macabre quest, leading to a dramatic and tragic conclusion in a film that has nothing to do with the devil, as the title suggests. Karloff, as usual, brings complexity to the character, portraying Blair as a man driven by grief. The idea of talking to the dead using scientific mixed with supernatural means was different than his other mad scientist films. But the standout is Anne Revere as the manipulative Mrs. Walters. Revere would later win a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for National Velvet. And like the film's director, she would face blacklisting during the HUAC era in 1950. Typical of the B-movies of the era, the film was made with a tight shooting schedule and was released at a time before the U.S. entered the war. It reflects the era's anxieties and fear about death and the consequences of scientific experimentation. This is a curious blend of science and the supernatural with a touch of cosmic horror. It uses electricity to demonstrate the power of life and death. The film takes a while to ramp up, and when it does, Mrs. Walters is the driving force, with Karloff's mad scientist tagging along so he can find a way to talk to his dead wife. The Devil Commands is available on DVD and streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below, if you would like to check it out. The Monster and the Girl from Paramount Pictures blends elements of crime thriller and monster movies, reflecting on the evolving landscape of American cinema in the early 1940s. Directed by Stuart Heisler, known for his later work on government propaganda films during World War II and television series like Gunsmoke. The plot revolves around Scott Webster, whose sister Susan is coerced into what the film calls dance hall work due to Hayes Code's restrictions on depicting prostitution. When Scott attempts to rescue Susan from the clutches of a crime boss, he is framed for murder and sentenced to death. The story takes a fantastical turn when a mad scientist transplants Scott's brain into a gorilla's body, and the gorilla then uses Scott's memories to seek revenge on those who wronged him. Ellen Drew, a Paramount contract actor, plays Susan Webster, while Paul Lucas portrays the villainous crime boss. Other cast members include Robert Page as Larry Reed, Onslow Stevens, who we discussed in previous films The Vanishing Shadow and Life Returns, plays J. Stanley McMasters, and Philip Terry as Scott Webster. The film was pulled from some theaters in cities like Milwaukee in the United States due to the perceived white slavery connotations in the context of its time, the monster and the girl can be seen as part of the broader trend in monster movies during World War II. It follows in the footsteps of films like The Walking Dead from 1936, which also combined elements of crime, science fiction, and horror. As one of several monster films produced by Paramount in the early 1940s, it represents the studio's attempt to compete with Universal's dominance in the horror genre. I thought it was an interesting idea, but it tried to pack in too many genres into its runtime, and it felt like several films smashed into one. The Monster and the Girl is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. I've mentioned the golden age of science fiction in previous videos in this series. Typically dated from the late 1930s to the 1950s, this was a period characterized by a significant increase in both the quality and quantity of science fiction stories. 
Under the leadership of John W. Campbell at Astounding Science Fiction magazine, the genre evolved towards more sophisticated, scientifically plausible, and socially conscious narratives, laying the groundwork for science fiction's growing respectability and influence. Key figures such as Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke were at the beginning of their careers in the early 1940s. Both Heinlein and Asimov were already publishing professionally, while Clarke was contributing to non-professional pulp magazines. In the following decades, each would make major contributions to the genre. In 1941, readers encountered some extraordinary novels and short stories. Robert A. Heinlein's Methuselah's Children, published in Astounding Science Fiction, explores the adventures of the long-lived Howard families as they flee Earth to escape persecution, discovering a universe teeming with life and new possibilities. Al Sprague de Camp and P. Schuyler Miller's Genus Homo tells the story of modern humans awakening in a future ruled by intelligent apes. It first appeared in super science novels this year. De Camp also published the novel Lest Darkness Fall, an alternate history where an archaeologist is transported to the Roman Empire and uses his modern knowledge to reshape history, a work that would go on to inspire the likes of Harry Turtledove. Science fiction wasn't just an American phenomenon in 1941. In Ariel, by Russian writer Alexander Belayev, a young boy gains the miraculous ability to fly after a scientific experiment. Czech writer J.M. Truska published Zapeus S. Nabum, chronicling a group of explorers venturing into the unknown depths of space. Hungarian author Sándor Setmari released Kazo Hina, where a shipwrecked sailor discovers two contrasting societies on a remote island, one utopian, the other dystopian. Two interconnected novellas by Robert A. Heinlein, Universe and Common Sense, were featured in Astounding Science Fiction. These stories were later combined into Orphans of the Sky and follow a young man on a generational ship whose inhabitants have forgotten they are on a spacecraft. Universe was adapted into a radio play in 1951. An Isaac Asimov's brilliant short story Nightfall, set on a distant planet perpetually bathed by sunlight by its six suns. A group of scientists must deal with the first nighttime in over 2,000 years. This story was adapted into a film in 1988, though the movie struggled to capture the story's profound depth and tension. Nineteen forty one was one of the deadliest years in history, as almost three point five million people perished. But history does not exist in a vacuum. Culture, science, the arts, and film both influence and are influenced by the course of history. When examining science fiction films, it is crucial to understand the broader context so we understand the science fiction of the latter part of the nineteen forties and into the nineteen fifties. And so for the rest of this episode, I would like to take a look at some historical, cultural events, and cinematic events that occurred in 1941. From January to August, over 10,000 lives were tragically taken at a German euthanasia center using carbon monoxide gas, marking the beginning of a horrific chapter in German history that would only worsen as the war progressed. In stark contrast, on January 6th, U.S. President Roosevelt addressed the nation with his visionary Four Freedoms speech, advocating for fundamental human rights worldwide. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armament. The Lend-Lease Act on January 10th allowed the United States to support its allies with military aid while officially remaining out of the war. This support became crucial in February when Winston Churchill urgently appealed for arms, stating, Give us the tools, and we'll finish the job. On May 10th, the Blitz, the German bombing campaign against Britain, ended after eight months. A new stage for global conflict was set on June 22nd, with the German launch of Operation Barbarossa. 
This massive invasion of the Soviet Union reshaped the Eastern Front and underscored a year that saw alliances solidify and battles escalate from the Balkans to the Pacific. The United States began an embargo on oil to Japan in July in response to Japanese aggression in Asia, heightening tensions between the two countries. The grim reality of war persisted with the devastating siege of Leningrad beginning on September 8th, symbolizing the endurance and suffering of civilian populations caught in the crossfire. The Battle of Moscow began in October and lasted until January 1942. This critical Soviet effort halted the German advance and was a pivotal turning point on the Eastern Front. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th forced the United States into direct conflict, and they declared war on Japan on December 8th. This in turn prompted declarations of war from Germany and Italy on the United States within days. The mood of 1941 was deeply influenced by the ongoing war. In the creative arts, there was a blend of propaganda and escapism. On March 17th, President Roosevelt officially opened the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., providing a centralized institution dedicated to preserving and promoting the nation's cultural heritage while also showcasing art from around the world. The Mount Rushmore National Memorial, featuring the colossal carved faces of four U.S. presidents, was dedicated on October 31st. This was another huge year for comic books. We saw the first issue of Captain America in late December 1940, and his popularity would grow in 1941. Issues would sell close to a million copies per month, despite facing controversy and threats from isolationist and Nazi sympathizers in the United States. Wonder Woman made her first appearance in All-Star Comics number 8, while Aquaman appeared in More Fun Comics number 73. Archie Andrews made his first appearance in Pep Comics number 22. We also got our first look at Bucky Barnes, Green Arrow, and The Penguin this year. In theater, Arsenic and Old Lace, a black comedy about murder, premiered. We also saw Blythe's Spirit by Noel Coward, and Richard Wright teamed up with Paul Green for a stage adaptation of Wright's novel Native Son. Chattanooga Choo Choo by Glenn Miller was a popular hit, topping the charts for nine weeks. The Ed Sullivan Show, The Orson Welles Show, The Adventures of the Thin Man were popular radio shows. And lastly, the scientific events and discoveries of 1941 that contributed to the advancement of knowledge in various fields. In computer science, two groundbreaking machines were introduced. German engineer Konrad Sosa presented the Z3, the world's first working programmable fully automatic computer while John Vincent Atanasoff and Clifford E. Berry developed the atanasoff berry computer. Medical research saw a breakthrough with the large-scale production of penicillin. Although discovered in 1928, it was in 1941 that scientists developed methods for mass production. And President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8807 on June 28, creating the Office of Scientific Research and Development. This office was tasked with producing an atomic bomb, initiating the Manhattan Project, which would officially begin its work in 1942. Hollywood continued to produce groundbreaking films in 1941, despite the shadow of World War II looming overhead that would reach the American people by the end of the year. The highest grossing film in the United States was about a World War I veteran, Alvin York, while an up-and-coming actor and director, only in his mid-twenties, created one of the greatest films of all time while breaking the rules of how films could be made. The attack on Pearl Harbor in December forced Hollywood to shift focus, intensifying its commitment to producing films that would rally support for the war despite challenges like production constraints and diminished international markets. The 14th Academy Awards for the films of 1941 were held on February 26, 1942 
after being temporarily canceled because of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. Sergeant York went into the night with 11 nominations and left with two wins. While How Green Was My Valley won Best Picture, it chronicles the life of a Welsh mining family through the eyes of the youngest son. This film beat out the Maltese Falcon, Citizen Kane, Sergeant York, and Suspicion. This was a stacked year for amazing films, though the winner is the least well-known of the bunch. John Ford won his third directing Oscar for his work on How Green Was My Valley. Gary Cooper won Best Actor for Sergeant York, and Joan Fontaine won Best Actress for Suspicion. In September, the United States Senate began an investigation into movie war propaganda, led by isolationist senators to examine allegations that Hollywood was producing pro-war films to influence public opinion in favor of American entry into World War II. Some of these films they cited included Foreign Correspondent and The Great Dictator, both from 1940, and A Yank in the RAF from 1941 but they ultimately failed to prove their case and they were overshadowed by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December. Some of the groundbreaking and popular films of the year include Sergeant York, directed by Howard Hawks, shows the true story of Alvin York, a pacifist who becomes a decorated hero during World War I. The film explores York's moral journey as he wrestles with his beliefs while serving in the military culminating in his heroic actions during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Suspicion, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Starring Cary Grant and Joan Fontaine, it follows a young woman who becomes increasingly suspicious of her charming new husband's intentions. The Maltese Falcon, directed by John Huston, this classic film noir follows private detective Sam Spade as he becomes embroiled in a quest for a valuable statuette, navigating a web of deceit and betrayal in 1940s San Francisco. Starring Humphrey Bogart as Spade, the film is renowned for its sharp dialogue, intricate plot, and iconic performances that define the genre. Dumbo, an animated film produced by Walt Disney Productions, tells the heartwarming story of a young circus elephant with oversized ears, who discovers he can fly, providing a touching message about acceptance and courage. And finally, Citizen Kane, directed by Orson Welles. This groundbreaking film chronicles the rise and fall of media mogul Charles Foster Kane. Known for its innovative narrative structure, deep focus cinematography, and use of non-linear storytelling techniques, the film has been hailed as a masterpiece and is often regarded as one of the greatest films ever made, solidifying Wells' reputation as a visionary director. Sci-Fi Cinema of 1941 was dominated by lower-budget mad scientists and monsters. Superheroes in both live action and animation made the jump from page to screen, showing Hollywood's interest in capitalizing on the growing phenomenon. American cinema began a shift in 1942, as men marched off to war and families on the home front watched, and Hollywood would begin to churn out patriotic stories about heroism and sacrifice. But would sci-fi change course or continue with the same old, same old? We'll begin that discussion in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. And I'd like to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you for all your encouragement. And I will see all of you in 1942.